This episode is brought to you by the Weather Channel app. Did you know the app can help you forecast more than just the weather? With allergy tracking and flu risk mapping. So you know when to stay inside and load up on podcast, As well as air quality and UV indexing. So you know when to get outside, load up on sunscreen and podcast. Forecast more of what you love with the Weather Channel app. Hi, my name is Travis McVeigh. I'm an anesthesiologist from Dallas, Texas. I host a podcast called Thank You Notes at Ars Longa Media. Showing gratitude to people just makes me feel good, and I want to share the practice of thank you notes with everybody who listens. I write thank you notes to people and then bring them on the show to read it to them. Past guests have included my high school teachers, my friends, other physicians, and a couple of internet celebrities. I will also be doing episodes that explore the science behind gratitude practices to demonstrate to everybody the actual tangible benefits of practicing gratitude. Listen everywhere you get podcasts and check out the extras on my social media accounts. Thank you for listening. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. And now here's your host, Patrick Beeman. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible. You can get a free copy of Adelaide Adesina's How to Prepare for the Medical Boards with your free Audible trial, just head to insidetheboards.com slash audible for details. Adelaide Adesina is the author of How to Prepare for the Medical Boards and the founder of Smash USMLE, as well as a MedEd YouTube sensation. His FTP lectures have had over 7 million views. In part one of our interview with him, he offers some advice on how to approach board exams, whether it's the Comlex, USMLE, or a shelf exam. And in part two, dives a little bit deeper into the Smash USMLE platform. In conjunction with this interview, Adelaide has offered listeners a one-month free trial of their Step 1 QBank, so you can head over to Inside the Boards slash episode 022 for details to grab the link and your free trial of the Smash USMLE program. As always, thanks so much for listening and telling your friends about the podcast. We're going to be devoting a whole series of shows to Step 1 specific content from March till May. So stay tuned and tell your friends we're going to help you learn on the go. And we've got some exciting offers, contests, and whatnot in association with that series coming up at the beginning of March. Subscribe to us on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. And follow us on Twitter at Boards Insider or on Facebook.com slash Inside the Boards and Instagram.com slash Inside the Boards. And now, our interview with Dr. Adesina, who, on top of being an emergency medicine physician, you will note, is also a father. And you can hear his kids trying to offer their own boards preparation advice in the background, just like you may have heard a crying baby lightly in the background in a few previous episodes of the podcast uh, that just goes along with the joys of parenthood and trying to make a quality audio production. So just enjoy that little slice of real life as well. Today we have Dr. Adeleke Arashina, who is the founder of Future Teaching Physicians Lectures, an online medical program for healthcare professional students in medicine and the other healthcare professions as well. Um, Importantly for today's purposes, he is the founder of Smash USMLE, that's smashusmle.com, um, which is a platform dedicated to helping medical students succeed on their board exams. Dr. Adashina is himself a 
um, emergency medicine physician, and he completed his medical training at uh, the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, the osteopathic side of things in 2012. He completed his emergency medicine residency at St. Luke's Hospital in Pennsylvania. He is the author of a book uh, which is available on Audible for free entitled How to Prepare for the Medical Boards. He's won a number of awards and his lectures, which are available on YouTube, have received 7.3 million views. So he knows what he's talking about. So Adeleke, thank you so much for your time. Let's open with our question of the day. This is from the Smash USMLE uh, Step 2 QBank. A 32-year-old male is brought by ambulance to the trauma center. He is in a C collar and responsive. He is noted to have an open, open tibia fracture. His vital signs are all within normal limits, except his heart rate is elevated to 120 beats per minute. He is conscious, and his Glasgow coma scale is normal. He claims that he wiped out on a curve on a gravel road on his motorcycle. His trauma exam is negative, except for his open fracture. He's admitted to the orthopedic service, and they are called to reduce and close his fracture. Postoperatively, he's admitted to the trauma ICU. His skin abrasions have been cleaned and washed with iodine, and the patient is placed on an oxycodone schedule. Uh, the patient does well overnight, but the next morning is noted to have a slightly increased temperature of 100.2 Fahrenheit, a BP of 101 over 68, and a diffuse rash in addition to dyspnea and confusion. His pulse is now 100 beats per minute. Upon examination, he has no jugular venous distension. He has rails bilaterally in multiple lung fields. A chest x-ray ordered this AM shows diffuse pulmonary edema. After... An arterial blood gas shows a pH of 5.08, a PCO2 of 30 millimeters of mercury, and a PO2 of 72 millimeters of mercury. Which of the following is your preliminary diagnosis? A, cardiac contusion. B, subdural hematoma. C, congestive heart failure. D, aspiration pneumonia. Or E, fat embolism. You might want to pause the podcast to think about the answer choices here. And the answer is E, fat embolism. All right. So first thing to note about that is that seems a lot like maybe a surgery shelf exam or step two question would go because the vignette is so long. There's a lot of info in there. So how, uh, doctor, would you pro approach this? So uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. So this is a great question that is commonly tested on the step two exam. And a lot of students just need to be familiar with the length of the question stem. The first thing is to basically approach the, the question stem first by highlighting the most important things they're giving you. We've got a 32-year-old male basically involved in an MVC that's in a C collar, has an open tibial fracture. And at least we have the normal GP, GCS uh, on arrival and was placed on a pain medication. Uh, after a few hours of being in the hospital, this patient became febrile, low, got a low grade fever of 100.2. Blood pressure was 101 over 62 and started developing a rash. But the most important thing is to know that this patient developed dyspnea and confusion, okay? That's basically where you need to focus your attention to. Also, a chest x-ray shows that the patient uh, has a diffuse pulmonary edema. Uh, and if you look at the ABG, first of all, let's take a look at that. The pH was 5.08. Uh, that tells you the patient is acidic. How about the PCO2? They say it was 30. We know the normal PCO2 is supposed to be 40. So this patient happens to have a low PCO2 that by hyperventilating. All right. And the PO2 is low. So we look at the uh, pulmonary, pulmonary uh, oxygen uh, level, which is about 72. All right, so the arterial oxygen level is low. So this patient is hypoxic, basically has a low PCO2 and it's also acidotic. The first thing you have to understand is that the patient has an open fracture, all right? And we're looking at a long bone fracture, which is very, very common in MVC. The correct answer obviously is gonna be a fat emboli because this is very, very common in a patient that has a, a recent bone fracture or trauma. And the reason is because basically fat emboli has a neutral fat which can easily diffuse into the venous circulation. Because once these patients break the bones, 
to get direct access into the Venus Plateau is around. And Bilib Jalal, this uh, clot, basically, if you look at it, it's almost similar to having almost like a pulmonary embolism, which is a, a blood clot compared to a, a fat embolism. Often these patients are asymptomatic in the first 12 to 36 hours, and then they start to develop neurologic and cardiopulmonary symptoms. That is very, very common in fat emboli uh, patients. And as you can see, they start with tachycardia, all right? They're tachycardic, they're dyspneic because they got a fat emboli that's stuck inside their pulmonary circulation, which basically triggers them to become tachypneic. And often what you notice is diffuse bilateral infiltrates, which is ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Often you might notice a particular rash. It's not always common, but on the board exam, they like to make things very classic. So you're going to notice that they're giving it away, telling the patient has a particular rash. And also because this patient has a diffuse lung injury, you're going to notice the arterial oxygen is going to be low, right? Because they have a VQ mismatch. They got a fat emboli, traveled all the way into their inferior vena cava gets into the right atrium and diffusely goes straight into the pulmonary circulation. So now this patient, because they have severe lung injury, right, they get like a, a massive uh, surge response, causes them to be, basically become more hypoxic. In this kind of patient, the only way to really treat them is supportive therapy. So patient with fat emboli has a very high mortality, and this is very, very important thing that you also need to do for the board exam. So the earlier you catch this, as a, even as a clinician, the better you can be able to really save this patient. I mean, they recommend you start the patient on oxygen, obviously, because they are hypoxic. Uh, if they continue to deteriorate, these patients might end up needing to be intubated if they cannot maintain their arterial oxygen levels. The other options which they are giving you, like cardiac contusion, would not be correct because in this case, uh, that would be from a blunt uh, heart trauma, all right, from an MVC. Uh, you see bruising on the chest wall if the patient has copies, have their chest wall basically crashed into the steering wheel. We have a direct impact just anatomically where the heart is located behind the sternum. And also subdural hematoma would not be a correct answer in this case because that would be a patient that presents with a severe hair trauma. They told us the patient initially had a normal GCS, which is a GCS of 15. So you will expect them to deteriorate probably in the first six hours of presentation compared to 12 to 36 hours. So this patient would not, that would not be the correct answer. Now, congestive heart failure will be a distractor in this question because you will think that the patient that is hypoxic, tachypneic, and also has diffuse pulmonary edema it will sound like a patient in congestive heart failure. But we have a 32-year-old young uh, male that has no other medical history. This did not mention any history of hypertension that will lead to hypertrophy that will cause this patient eventually to develop congestive heart failure. They're describing a patient that has a traumatic incident. And also, you should pay attention to the physical exam, right? So in the physical exam, they said the patient has no JVD, right? That's kind of giving it away, because if the patient has right heart failure, you should expect that the pressure in the superior vena cava uh, to be elevated because of the pressure in the right atrium, causing backflow of blood back into the circulation, causing them to have elevated JVD. So that's one way to kind of eliminate congestive heart failure as an option in this question. And looking at the last one is aspiration pneumonia. Well, this patient would not have developed pneumonia in this case uh, because pneumonia would probably present as a focalized infiltrate. So this is your best way of eliminating questions if you're having trouble answering questions at the board. So the best answer in this case is fat emboli. So fat emboli, the take homes you would say is long bone injury with respiratory involvement, specifically an ARDS type picture, which has the classic finding on the boards of bilateral diffuse pulmonary infiltrates. What else? What are the, the real things that, that people should take away? The essential points that are going to appear on the boards regarding fat emboli. So anytime you hear a, a long bone fracture, patient with neurologic deterioration after a long bone fracture with tachycardia, shortness of breath, confusion, hypoxia, and a rash, those are the classic symptoms of a fat emboli. So those are the things you need to watch out for on the board exam that's given away. Anytime you hear a long bone fracture, always think the first thing is a fat emboli. Okay, fair enough. 
Um, and I think I, I read a, a pH of 5.08, but um, I meant to say 7.08. Yeah, that would be a typo. That was a pH of 7.08. There's some learning for you guys. Now let's uh, kind of delve into a little bit about you, Adelaide. You have taken just about every board exam one can take in the U.S. Uh, medical system. Is that correct? <laughs> That's very correct, Patrick. Well, I guess I'd, I'd want to ask, I guess the <laughs> the mean way to put it was, would be, what is wrong with you? I guess um, the nicer way to put it would be, um, why? Why did you do that? <laughs> that? That's a great question, actually. So so when, when I got to an osteopathic medical school, uh, when I um, got, I basically only thought the exam that I can take was the USMLE because I've been exposed to the allopathic world as a pre-medical student. So I did a summer program called SMDEP in the summer when I was a, a, the third year of college. And basically I did, an, I did an allopathic medical school. So I thought the only exam was USMLE. So I was preparing my mindset that eventually when I get into medical school, this is the exam of choice. But when I got to uh, my uh, medical school, I realized I have to take the complex exam, which is basically equivalent of the USMLE. For those of you guys who don't know, the complex is the comprehensive osteopathic medical licensing exam. has three parts, just like four parts, just like the USMLE. You got level one, level two, uh, and then you have level two PE, which is the equivalent of uh, step two CK, and level three. CS. So. CS, CS, I meant to say. So basically, the reason I actually drove me to do this is because I already had a preconceived notion I was going to take both exams. But it was more of actually a, a motivation because when I was applying to medical school, uh, I went to one of the admission committee at the allopathic school, and they told me that I cannot pass the USMLE because I didn't do well on my MCAT enough at that point in time. So I had a mission to prove people wrong that, yes, I can do well on the USMLE, and also the fact that the secondary uh, gain was that it was going to give me a lot more options on, as an osteopathic medical student to be able to match into any residency I wanted. So that's why I had to decided to take this exam, eight hour long exam. I know it sounds crazy, but um, I was determined and I did it. And I did extremely well in all three of the exams. So <laughs> can't complain. Um, and actually, I think a little bit more of your story specifically, um, you outline yourself in the How to Prepare for the Medical Boards book, uh, which is available on Amazon, um, on your website, smashusmle.com, um, as well as on Audible is a free audio book. So you can get a free Audible trial and listen to it, which is what I did. So, <laughs> But is that correct? A little bit more detail, if I remember correctly. You, you kind of outline each of the, the pros and cons of taking, if you're an osteopathic student, both the USMLE and the Comlex, um, as well as share a little more personal insight. Yeah, absolutely. It's a challenge for DO students every year that they have to face the reality of, should I take the USMLE or not? And I just have a simple answer. You really don't have to take if you're an osteopathic student because that's eight hour long exam, another five hundred and twenty something dollars plus test. It's costing over a thousand dollars. So if you're a strong student and you know what you're doing and you're willing to have good reasons, uh, I wanted to match into uh, an emergency medicine program. In the end, it worked out for me, but. But students that don't do well on these exams, if you take your USMLE, uh, it's actually pretty bad because it makes you look like, like a weak air candidate when you apply for residency and they frown upon it, even this program director. So, you know, I strongly recommend that, you know, if you accept you're a strong candidate, I wouldn't recommend you do it. When you were studying for all those board exams, um, what resources did you use? Let's say specifically uh, with respect to step two and shelf exams we'll save step one okay great that's a good question so i for step two i used uh first date obviously and i used uh master the boards i use uh usml secrets and i also use usml world uh to study so that was my question bank uh that i used to study at that point so you you like master the boards conrad fisher is a friend of mine so i definitely support uh master the boards and i myself used uworld uh, as my step two Q bank and a little bit of first aid too. 
Or do you think that those constitute a, a pretty solid uh, foundation for a step two preparation or level two? I think they're great resources. Um, obviously, there are pros and cons. And what you will find out about step two is that there is no one comprehensive book for step two. If you use first aid, for example, you will notice the surgery component is not as detailed. So, for example, we talk about fat embolism and, you know, you might notice that you might not get a lot of content as you want to understand the surgical component. And, you know, Masters Boy is a great book. I think it kind of cuts out through the, uh, goes straight to the point, through the meat of what you really need to know for that exam. So, you know, everybody uses a combination of all of those, but you definitely have to have at least one or two Q-bands that's solid. And your world is a very popular one a lot of students use. And I used it uh, when I studied for my boards. So. What about shelf exams? Some people don't attach as much weight to these, but I think they can be important, especially for specialties for which there is a shelf exam to do well on that. And it even has the potential for maybe convincing a program director that, that you'll be able to pass your specialty boards if maybe you didn't do as stellar on, say, step one or step two, you know, getting a, a rocking score on a general surgery uh, shelf exam may be a huge asset to your residency application if maybe you only did as average or less than you uh, would like to have on the step or level exam. So how did you approach studying as a third year? So third year was fun. I mean, you had more time to master a lot of the content in a month or six weeks. So every uh, rotation had its own book. And, you know, you probably talk to your upperclassmen, depending on what year you are. You know, some of the books you may recommend may still be valid. They may not. But, you know, some people use case files. For example, for surgery, I've used Surgery Secret, uh, USML Secrets to yep. Surgery. So I used that book. I thought it was a really good book. Uh, so there are different books. For internal medicine, I used Step Up to Medicine. It was excellent. I finished the book and I got honors on in that uh, rotation. My advice is that find a book that you know that's not overwhelming. Do questions as you're going along also in your third year. So that's kind of like, so you can master the clinical component of, med uh, of medicine. And basically, you know, you just want to be more efficient. So stick with one plan. So don't try to jump from one book to another. You know, if you have one specific book that you, uh, a lot of people are recommending for the upperclassmen, I would recommend you try it. If you like it within the first couple of days, stick with it. If it's not working for you, find something early in the first week and try to finish that book because that's the only thing that's going to determine how well you do when the shelf exam comes along. And you want to get honors as much as you can. Some people schools just pass or fail, but you know, if you have honors in your school, then that's what you want to shoot for, especially if you're applying for residency in that specialty. Yeah. You did well on your, your step exams, but that's uh, not always the most interesting part of a person. Do you have any test taking failures in your academic history or things or times at which maybe you didn't perform as well as you think you should have because of the time you put in or something of that nature? And what did you learn from those experiences? That's a great question, Patrick. Earlier in my career, obviously, the MCAT was my major challenge getting to medical school. Practically almost failed my first MCAT, you know, for the lack of a better word, but, you know, for the scores that I got, it was pretty low and I was doing poorly in my uh, verbal component. I wouldn't forget that. So, and I learned that I was not focusing on what I was weak at. Hmm. You know, I was a bio, I was a biochemistry major. Uh, I was also a bi double major in biology. So I loved chemistry. I love physics, you know. But I was struggling in the verbal component, and yet I was ignoring throughout the entire time of my study. Uh, so that kind of really affected my score when I took my MCAT. Fast forward uh, two years later, I was studying for my board exam. One thing I learned was that I was not very good at biostatistics earlier on. One thing I would say was, what will I mean my even board score higher than what it was earlier on uh, when I took my board exam, was that by the time I realized that I was weak in it, it was too late. It was about almost like a week before my board exam, I really kind of consistently scored a little bit lower on learning about sensitivity and specificity and p-values and power, and, you know, things like that. That's, they are not exciting at all. I got to be honest with you. They are not. They're boring. Yes. But now that I'm an attending physician, when I read a journal article in the JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, this is how 
articles have been written randomized control trials, you know, they use all the statistical value to validate their studies. So since I was a student back then, I didn't know the implication and the importance of those things. What I'll give you, that, that's one of my failures. You know, I'll say like, I didn't do as well as I wanted and even it reflected on my board score. Like I did super well in every single uh, subject. And when it came to my behavior science, it was pretty awful, you know? And I said, wow. So if you're a student, please. I mean, a lot of people say that sort of thing when it comes to advice, like know what your weaknesses are and then shore them up. Taking what you learned from your MCAT and then facing the, the biostats portion of level one, step one, what did you do or change when it came to step two or a shelf exam or any other exam you've had to take as a, a physician? I try to switch up my study habits. So I realized not one method applied to everything. You know, during the course of medical school, like when I used to study biochemistry, for example, I used to have these white charts, like I bought them from Staples and I just stuck them on the wall, they're detachables. And I would draw a pathway on it. And I stuck it in my bedroom. So every time I wake up in the morning, the first thing I see on the board is, a, you know, glycolysis pathway. Yes. I didn't realize it was a subconscious learning. That's kind of what I call it. You know, every time I walk by it, I realize, oh, that's that enzyme again. And it reinforced the concept without you know, me constantly actually focusing on it. It just kind of diffused kind of learning. So that was one way I studied. The other way I also applied is like my micro sections, for example, I did my own flashcards. So like I'll go through the whole textbook and handwrite every single bug and try to write the, you know, what, what components of that bug and the disease associated with it. And it was very painful, like I gotta tell you guys, but by the time I got through the cards and I've written maybe like, you know, 100 or 150 cards myself, it was actually an active learning process. So like, you know, the next time I went through the cards, it was just like I was just kind of flipping through them and I can guess what's at the back of the card. So that really worked out well for me. Some books I can read just by themselves. I'll highlight and take notes on the side. I think learning the different modalities that work for me. And I'm also an audio learner. So like I'll pop in like going audio in my ear, like when I'm going to the gym and, you know, within an hour of just listening to going and I'm like, oh, wow, like I just learned everything about you know the fatty acid pathway or like, you know, you just talked about, you know, ALL, you know, and I'm like, wow, you know, so, you know, using all these different modalities is really what kind of helped me. Uh, and also obviously doing a lot of questions because, uh, you know, I think people underestimate the power of doing questions and that I, I just kind of kind of expand a little bit. So I remember when I started doing questions without reading anything, like I have not read a thing and I'm getting every question wrong, but I'm reading the correct and incorrect answers. And it's miserable. Like I almost sometimes want to cry. Like I'll score like a 20%. And I'm like, I'm a medical school, I'm sorry, 20% the, uh, <laughs> for the board questions. But it, it didn't matter because that's just the practice portion of it. You know, by the time I got through it over and over and over again, the concepts start to clear up and I can connect to God. So uh, that's kind of how I learned it. It's kind of work. And that concludes part one of our interview with Dr. Adesina in the next show, which we'll release next week. He discusses more about Smash USMLE as a platform. This episode's music is brought to you by Forgive Durden. The track is Life is Looking Up off the album Razia's Shadow. You can listen to the song in full over at insidetheboards.com slash episode 022. Thank you for supporting the artists who provide music for the show and give me the opportunity to evangelize the bands and artists that I love in a context other than the OR where detractors tend to be a little more vocal. If you have somebody you want to hear on the podcast that has a sort of arguably medical theme, shoot me an email to info at insidetheboards.com and I will see if we can feature your favorite artists for the bump music. Inside the Boards is in no way affiliated with the United States Medical Licensing Examination, Comprehensive Osteopathic Medical License Examination, National Board of Medical Examiners, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, or any other licensing or examination body. All exam names and other trademarks are the property of the respective trademark owners. 
Content discussed during the program is the property of Inside the Boards or the attributed trademark owner and may not be reproduced without permission from the appropriate entity. Inside the Boards fully adheres to the respective policies on irregular behavior outlined by the aforementioned credentialing bodies.